Hello and welcome to The Machine is the Message. Uh, we've got another set of links for y'all. Okay, cool. Let's jump into it. So the first thing I wanted to like plug is uh, I'm very excited because there is this uh, you know other nerd uh, in Europe somewhere who's built like a way for you to build UIs in the web. Uh, it can be WebXR, which is like full 3D, or it can be like just on the 2D web. Uh, and everything is rendered in 3D. It's all OpenGL and it's all kind of like you use uh, divs and you kind of use like an HTML like syntax. It's super fast. Uh, it's full 3D. So you can do like transforms um, on the Z axis. And, and it's based on this other thing, that another nerd I suppose made called uh, React 3 Fiber. So this is React 3 UI kit and you can kind of see the latest there. And then um, my contribution to that has been uh, this thing called f2r3.com. So you can go there and basically you can take any Figma file, copy the link to the composition, and then uh, paste it into this uh, little exporter tool. See it work here. Uh, and you basically paste in your Figma file. It will take all the layers. It'll make it into 3D. Any links that you have linked in your prototype in Figma, it'll like make those clickety clack next to each other. Uh, and then the real bonus is that you can take that comp and you can put your headset on your Quest Pro or perhaps even your Apple Vision. I will never buy one of those. Um, it's just too expensive. Uh, and you can go and view it and it's in full 3D. So here you can see like messing around in 3D, uh, an example of a menu. Uh, and then it also has just a, a pagination of your layers. So the quick thing to do is like take any comp, put it in your link and it'll kind of act like a slideshow but you can also link it up with the Figma prototyping tools. <clears throat> and then through this thing called HMD link, open it up in your headset. Uh, and then in Quest, you can enter immersive and you will get your comp in 3D uh, to play around with. So this is like kind of alpha. Yeah, and uh, the goal is to make it like super easy to bring things into 3D uh, and into headset and have this loop of like, I could see it in 3D and I can design for it in Figma. So that's that. Yeah, I think it's it's true. It's like, you know, we don't have a mental model on how to develop or design for these kind of interactions because they're just not prominent, right? Like you're not walking around with a Quest uh, strapped to your head most of the day. We do have it for our mobile phone. And so like, I think one thing that's interesting about Apple Vision Pro and Quest is there are devices that you look through. So like our prior model for understanding design, graphic design, you know, all the way back to print has been that you design the artifact. But what happens when the artifact is something you're looking through and the, and the way that that visually manifests is actually kind of TBD, like you can figure that out. So in, this, in, in the phone metaphor, with a, with a headset, you can have a phone that you're looking at and then you can have like a tablet and you can have a computer. And those are like all because you're looking through this device. One of my favorite games in VR, I think I mentioned it before, is a game called Virtual Virtual Reality. And you put on headsets in the game and you're like in a new place and then you take off headsets and then you realize the whole time you were like wearing a headset. And so like this notion of like inception, like UI inception, and that uh, perhaps the metaphor in VR for interaction is that you are instantiating different devices and that we can use our old tools of mobile design except now instead of designing for one phone you're actually designing for an array of devices that somebody has at their disposal <laughs> I haven't taken it off yet so all right <clears throat> so speaking of kind of crazy futures this is a demonstration and it is uh it is i think they basically captured the environment uh and what they can do with that then is they use this weird a robot dog to demonstrate the point, but you say like, where were my keys? And it'll walk you through where your keys were. I don't know why it's not, let me just reload this. Um, Cause it's kind of funky to see this thing move around. They perceive it interact. Where did I leave my keys? And then it'll say they're on the coffee table. Well, how will it know that? Because you're kind of walking around with this spatial thing on. Where did I leave my badge? And it can not only like tell you where it is, but kind of walk through to this kind of digital twin and tell you where your badge was uh, and what it's next to. So there's an understanding of all the things 
um, in your room uh, and map them spatially. Active discovery, do I have any fruit left in my home? So this is it, like thinking, where would the fruit be? Oh, uh, I think I saw a banana. So it's querying your environment. This is all based on a virtual environment. So this whole thing is not a real, it is real house, but it's been captured. So nothing here is like a kind of active, um, you know, you're walking around your house doing this. It's uh, a framework, I think open source framework to uh, do an open vocabulary embodied question answer benchmark. So it's like a way to query the environment around us based on some capture of that environment. Yeah, that's right. And I think like, the model itself has these attributes, which are useful to talk about. Oh, object localization, where's that thing? Object state recognition, like what state is it? Is it a rotten banana? Uh, object recognition, is it a banana? Attribute recognition, so like what about the bits? Besides, maybe it's like, it's a right banana. World knowledge, um, and functional reasoning. So like, hey, where is the banana? I'll look in the fridge. Spatial understanding, so like it's above this, it's next to that. Um, so all those kind of, uh, things are a benchmark of how you would measure such a AI. And the point here is that this model does very well on those things. So, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's going to be interesting. Cause I mean, we were talking about like designing for 3d, what, how do you think about it? But then also like now the AI can kind of think about your space. So who knows where that goes? Yeah. Yeah. And as you can imagine, there's like all kinds of privacy implications. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, I think the kind of, you know, we go back to the always on observer and like, I mean, even the sticky notes behind you, like to be able to say, Hey, what was that note I made about the sauna? And it'd be like, Hey, and what was the note, what was the note beside it? It's like, what was that category? You know? Um, yeah, I think it could be super useful. So <clears throat> switching gears to music. Do you want to tell us about this one? yu gi -Oh. I'm not sure if the audio is going to come through, but I got an error. Uh, uh, oh, I see. Yeah, it's not it's not working manual mode. Maybe I have to turn that on. That's really a, kind of a fail. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so they're getting a lot of traffic. Yeah, I think uh, that's nuts. I think the other piece to this is that uh, there's this guy who posted about is actually doing comedy. So it does like a comedy show where it's like making some jokes, a speech where it's like a riveting speech about the future, a commercial where it's like talking about a new phone, radio broadcast, sports announcing, nature sounds, <clears throat> ASMR. So it's like, it's not just music. It's got a deep understanding of the audio format and has all these samples. And I do think there's a question where you know, I saw another uh, tweet about, you know, we need to refine the language we're talking about when, when Udio says, check out the new thing that XYZ user has made because they didn't really make it like by typing in, you know, cool jazz song. A am I participating in the creative process? Like maybe the tip of the iceberg in the way, like applying a filter to <clears throat> something in Photoshop would be, but, uh, but it's not really creating, right? And so all these samples are, some of them like are so close to the original artist that they're clearly just copyright infringement. So like, I wonder about how we're gonna talk about what it means to build something or what it means to create something. AI really, in this case, brings that into question. Yeah, totally. And then the question is like, where do we draw that line? How do we draw that line? Who draws that line? <clears throat> I think, um, one of the interesting cases was, and I don't have a link for this, but uh, and I heard it on another podcast, which is like Ed Sheeran. Uh, he went to court for like some song that he made that was like Marvin Gaye. And he kind of goes through and plays like the classic four chords that make up like any song, any pop song. And the point is like the way that artists make music is that they learn other people's music. And so then they learn a wide body of music and then they can build on it. So to, to me that like on the surface feels like creativity. Like that's what, certainly what I do. We're inspired by all these links. We're going to go make something. Um, but at what point does it like veer into the area of like straight out copying without any ad additive um, value? And are we going to break that down to some technical thing? Like what, what training data did you use? Or are we going to break it down to like, Hey, what does the output sound like? 
does it actually sound like the original? Well, if it doesn't actually sound like the original, but they used all these samples, you know, does that does the fact that they used all these samples matter? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'd probably if you're on the side of like, if it sounds like me and you've just straight up copied me, I don't care how you got there. I did it first. I don't know. But it's, it's a very hard argument. Uh, yeah. Um, cool. What else we got in here? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Okay. Tell me about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 There's kind of like, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, diversity of options. So like I, I didn't think about VR dentist practices. So there's kind of that. These things do read to me like, you know, a guy who comes up to you like, oh, you you do like web design, you do app design. I got an app idea. It's like, okay, cool. Like, tell me about your app idea. Um, and I think like what's probably missing here that is make or break for a new product is <clears throat> what what's your go to market strategy like, or just who are who are your first like hundred customers? Um, perhaps that's what you get if you you know that they show you the Reddit posts. I think like another thing is like what why is now an important time or what technology unlocks this use case and where does this fit in the existing industry like how is this going to take the pie from somebody else or make the pie bigger for the market uh and then I think probably there's something about why are you uniquely suited to do this like is it about the city you're in the industry you're in so yeah I think it's a really cool like demo and uh, you can imagine just it being augmented with some other pieces that help you figure out like what you are uniquely c capable of doing and who the customers out there who are like, yes, please do this. I will give you money. Like even just if they could <clears throat> do a Kickstarter for like everything here and somebody could ch chip in 10 bucks if it's, uh, if it's going to get done. But I think that there is like bounty things like that already. So anyway, it's super, super interesting. Uh, approach to Reddit data. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the, like, this is like, you know, the previous thing is kind of, if you're wondering about what types of ideas are out there, then you have like an idea and you put it into this thing, then you send this to your friends and then they put in 10 bucks and you have like a validation there. And it's super interesting for sure. So here we see. I need deeper account customization. And we've pulled that out from a customer interview that says, I want to create temporary profiles for guests. So that's like a subset of this category that we've got here. Okay. Uh -huh. Interesting. So let me, uh, so yeah, these are kind of pretty cool examples of how AI can help you at the beginning with testing the concept and then actually like getting a product out there and understanding the needs um, and synthesizing them on like, what feature you work on next. I'm curious. You know, from your perspective, thinking about like uh, building these features as a new startup, uh, how much of it is like unknown? Like, is this about finding out like, oh, I didn't know I needed X, Y, or Z, or like building confidence? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I think it's thank you for bringing in the housing. Uh, crisis in Toronto as an example, because it feels so physical and policy oriented that, you know, an unlock, whether it is through like just user research, like research, you know, design research or through AI um, is kind of refreshing. So I think that that's like a great thing to, to look at. And then it is a question of like, it is also informing policy. So like how much policy is informed by doing like in-depth needs analysis of end customers, i.e. citizens versus like just trying a bunch of stuff, seeing what fails. And then the next government, you know, guesses at, at what's going to work and different people lobby for different things. So I think that there's like, yeah, the housing crisis is a super interesting example. So let's, I'm going to jump ahead and I want to use this as like a case study. So this is our housing minister. We're living through a housing crisis. Um, he's uh, introducing the new policy for 2024. He's saying uh, one way we can help is cut taxes. Uh, and so he's talking about removing GST, uh, put more measures in place to build these kind of more affordable homes. But he's also saying like another way we can do it is by allowing uh, new types of technologies. So I'll just read some of this of, you know, 
we're building the way we did a century ago, but there's new technologies that allow us to scale up production. He's showing like a 3D printed home. Um, and we're going to make it easier to rent or buy places to live. If you're buying your first home, they're changing the rules around mortgages. So you can spread more of your payment over a longer period of time. Uh, and then they're also putting in like a, a uh, bill of rights for renters uh, that allows you to have more protections. So, so you can see, like, you can almost imagine the kind of like fast forward board that they like think that they have. Um, which is like, oh, renters have this problem. People buying a home have that problem. But I think the issue is there's so many other options, right, to help with housing. And what's often like hard to figure out is like, oh, people want a different type of home. Like, you know, some people want like a cohabitated home where they have like a shared washroom and kitchen. Like some people are like totally okay living in a much smaller space and having a giant gym like the kind of like diversity of um, build types that you would get out of like a broad swath policy decision versus like a kind of niche startup product are like really different. And so I, I, I don't know how to, I'm, how to formulate this question, but maybe it is like, how can we apply this type of uh, user needs analysis, product innovation, startup ideas, um, validation to something like the housing crisis in Toronto slash Canada. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like a huge market opportunity if indeed there is uh, not enough housing and there's a bunch of people willing to pay for it. I think there's another side of the problem, which is like, perhaps Canada is not paying people enough. And perhaps the problem is that, you know, our salaries or income doesn't match like other folks who are coming in buying houses. But one thing like I'll also point to, because we're just on this Canada thread, is this kind of tweet about um, uh, a critical effort for uh, Canadian productivity. Create the conditions, incentives, and culture for the nine U of T and Waterloo Y Combinator uh, founders highlighted in this visual to build in Canada during uh, and after uh, Y Combinator. On a per capita basis, these schools punch above their weight. So this is a little chart that says like, who's going to Y Combinator? Yes, it's like a, it's like a kind of weird metric to look at, but Y Combinator is like probably the premier uh, incubator for early stage startups, uh, especially uh, people out of the university. So Stanford, obviously the top, then MIT, Berkeley, Harvard, then U of T. Then we've got Cornell, Georgia Institute of Technology, and then Waterloo. So like, you know, they are, we are on the chart, but all of these people are moving away from Toronto and Waterloo to go to the new area. And so there's a reason that they're doing that. And it's not just because YC is there. There's also conditions here that are kind of just not uh, conducive to doing innovative startups and getting funding for that stuff. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> that rings true. So there's like a, that's the culture piece. And, and it's also like just the incentives and like financing piece. I guess I just look at this guy, Sean Frazier's uh, video, and he's looking at this like one company, which is like printing houses out of like concrete, which is cool. Like it's a cool visual, but the innovations in housing are not just about like printing concrete. They're about financing. They are about like this crowdfunding product validation. Like I think we're thinking much too narrow about what it will take to have enough housing for everybody. Even just like dividing a house into condos is something that happened in New York and San Francisco decades ago. And now it's like a controversial thing to do in Toronto. And so I just feel like we have such a wealth of talent and new thinking about what the future can do. We have all these abilities for AI to like surface needs, validate products, get people on board you know, like see where those, those needs are. And those, those should be applied to housing. Like housing is a product in the same way, like a car is a product or a phone is a product and there are different types of housing and we're building a record amount of it. Now we need to build way more than we've ever built. We should think about what good housing means and it shouldn't be, um, you know, just like we can pour cool concrete. Like it should be about the user needs that we're serving. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, well, if you guys have suggestions or ideas on how to apply AI or technology or this sort of product thinking to housing in Toronto or Ontario or the world, please let us know. Um, all right, let's jump on to the next topic, which is the AI workforce is here, the rise of the new labor market. What's the deal? So this is kind of like... This is kind of like you have like 25 laborers that come to your farm every year and you like pull the crop. You guys all do that. I've got something for you. It's called a tractor. You know, you're not going to need any of them. Right. And that's, that's the SAS product. All right. What, what, yeah, I think, um, what's interesting here too is of that 0 0.001 dollar. Um, so a uh, tenth of a cent. How much of that is electricity? Like it's probably mostly electricity, right? So what does that mean in a world where actually the problem with nuclear isn't that it is like um, it's too expensive? The problem structurally for that industry is that we don't need that much energy. So nuclear is a base load. It's constantly producing. There are times where nuclear power plants pay people or companies specifically to take their energy. And so there, that's a negative cost of energy. So what does it mean if you combine nuclear with this chart of AI, which says like even the cost of doing these things is next to zero. So it reminds me actually of when I was at Sidewalk, kind of a meme. I think Larry said was, uh, what would happen if the cost of of transportation went to zero? Maybe it wasn't when I was at Google, but it was kind of like about Waymo, which is to say, like, what are the ramifications, second order, third order, fourth order ramifications, consequences of transportation going to zero? Like, what does that do for food delivery? What does that do for housing? You know, what does that do for parking? What does that do for all of these different aspects of life? When you take something that is a known expense and it is a friction of doing business, it is a friction of working together, it's a friction of daily life, and you bring it down to zero. Um, it is an interesting thought experiment, but it's also an interesting <laughs> phenomenon that we're seeing at play like right now. Nice. Yeah. Spend on people versus spend on software. Wow. Interesting. So despite the fact, right. So we got 40 trillion for employees. We got, um, 15 trillion for services and we got, you know, 1 trillion for software. And so like that compared with that previous chart, we look at like, you know, what you get out of it. Clearly there's, you know, if you were purely economically minded, you would say we're not spending enough on software. We need to kind of invert, which is scary. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. And I think that, um, you know, we look at this and we say, actually, you know, because of capitalism, all of these gains are going to accrue to the asset holders, i.e. the people who own the companies. I think there's a very interesting alternate future, which is going to take a lot of work and would, would, uh, is by no means certain, but it's possible that the most irrelevant replaceable function that AI can help us with is CEOs, management, and shareholders. Perhaps, you know, that's what AI disrupts and we can kind of chip in and own the companies that are creating this wealth uh, in a much easier way. And we don't need the kind of accruals to this kind of financial elite. Uh, perhaps they're the ones that, that are made irrelevant by this. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And transparently. All right, cool. So I'm going to uh, pop through these next three links because I, you know, it's a change of tone. Uh, check out this article, some awesome charts and ways to think about stuff. Uh, I'm going to do this one last. So this is uh, Screen AI. Google had like a big thing in Las Vegas. They talked about all their new technology. One of them is Screen AI. So this is a vision language model for user interfaces. We saw something like this in Lamb, which was Rabbit, talked about uh, language action model but it's basically an ability to look at the screen and know what's going on on the screen. Like, uh, you know, this is a screen of some food. There's some different actions here. There's a rating. So it's basically like, what if the AI could understand interfaces and use them for you 
uh, what would you be able to do? So that's one piece, which is AI read. Yes. Okay. Okay. Hello. Hello. Should we continue or? Yeah, yeah, we can, we can keep going for a bit. Okay, cool. So there's a really cool thing that the AI can read your screen and act on it. It's any screen. So like traditionally we'd have to rely on like the markup and like the semantic labels on these UIs. Now it can just read anything. It could read a newspaper and tell you how to use the newspaper. So, okay, could re use, uh, read a newspaper. So then we also have uh, this new development, Open UI. So this is an ability for AI to build uh, UIs for you. So you can kind of describe uh, what you want. You can say, actually, I love the nav bar, but change it to something more purple. So this is similar to Versal's V0. Uh, which is a way for you to describe what you want in the UI and uh, the computer will make it. So the computer can generate the UIs, the computer can use the UIs. And then the question is, well, what's the future of human user interaction? What is uh, human computing interaction? So that's where the next piece comes in, which is this brain device. Um, so, you know, this, we're getting closer and closer to a wearable uh, brain computing interface. Uh, and you can play things with your mind. What's really notable about this is the price point is much cheaper. Uh, it's much more accessible. You don't need to put like a little uh, hole into your head. Uh, and so I do wonder, how, I'm trying to figure out how these things connect, but if the computer is making the screens and reading the screens and you're just kind of like using your thoughts, where does that leave us? And you know, if you think about something, is it gonna make a UI for you? And then some other AI reads that UI and then it does something like what, what, how do you think this stuff stacks up? Okay. Here's what I think about this. And there's a few intersecting trends, right? There's one, which is like, well, what were the screens for anyway? Right? Like it was a place for us to be able to see what was going on inside of the computer and then touch and interact with it and have a conversation with the computer. Right? Now what we're seeing is at least we can talk to the computer in a completely new way in terms of how we move things around. We still need to get things into our eyes, like we need to consume information in one way. And that's it, at least, you know, with, with 3D, we're seeing something different there. But generally, like, you know, we need to see the interfaces. Um, but as far as making selections, that can be different. Here, I think about the interface itself as something where it's like, how are we, what it's, there's so many con, like things that are kind of going at it. And I think about like the software, here's, here's an example where interfaces just kind of get screwed, right? Is like in, uh, cybersecurity. So let's say you're doing a cybersecurity product and you need to show alerts to a user so they can see when there's an attack coming in from some other person, you know, on the other side. And so it, it, it serves this purpose. On the other side, let's say you put AI over there and now the attacks are coming in so quickly that there's a person can't even respond to it again. And now an AI needs to you know, respond to those. Now an AI is a computer, it's in the computer. It, like, it doesn't need this screen to be between it and, uh, and the, the other AI attacker. They can just be kind of like in the computer, right? So it's, it's totally different. Yet we have this layer in between that's kind of for us, but other computers can use it. So computers can kind of like speak two languages where we can only speak one, but now we get one and a half because we can just think into the computer, right? I don't know. Those are some of the things that I see like coming together around this. That it's just, it's weird. And like, it's tough to know what's going to get trimmed away because it was vestigial and archaic and what is core and won't disappear. Yeah, here's one way to think about it, which is uh, it used to be that on the internet, you could only send text to each other. So you have like things like IRC or BBSs or things where basically you're typing stuff and you send it to somebody else, they read the stuff. Then we have markup. So like we have a browser and now you can kind of like bold stuff. And then Mosaic releases the notion of the image tag. And now you can have images. And so now our modern day websites are still sending this text back and forth, it's markup, but you will never look at the HTML. You will never look at that markup 
you will only look at the output of that markup on both sides of the equation. And so we have this text behind, but we really just experience the web. Perhaps in the future, like I will form a thought and it will like be like, hey Al, when do you want to do the podcast? It'll like form a web page and make a UI and like send that over to your UI, uh, your AI. And then that AI like reads the thing coming in and it's like, actually, I'm going to click on this button and schedule in this calendar. And then all you hear is like, hey, Patrick wants to meet. He, you know, how does Saturday at, at 10 a.m. Uh, work for you? Yeah, sounds good. Then that makes the UI, sends it back over to the other AI, that thing reads. So like perhaps UI will actually fade into the background and become kind of like the HTML markup um, of the past. And we will just simply be having conversations with each other. That's some weird future. It's crazy to think that we'd still have to make UIs that we're not using, yes. Yes. right? Like, yeah. it is it is crazy, but it's also crazy that like behind all of these websites, there's these things that say script. Whose benefit is that yeah. for? Like, no computer cares that this says script or that this is title. That that doesn't matter. But it's all English. So with that. We'll leave you with uh, our our pontifications, and perhaps uh, in 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 uh, sometime soon we'll be communicating this via brainwaves podcast to you. That'll be weird, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. And I'm looking forward to the point where we we're kind of already there um, as far as like you know the chat of there's a few websites where you can put in a podcast and you can. Uh, basically ask questions of the podcast and it works pretty well. And it's like you're conversing with the guests because there's enough speech patterns, you know, from the guests. And we're getting really close to that point where like, dude, if we do enough of these, people are just going to be able to talk to us about AI. <laughs> because, like, and, it, or like not us, but like a version of us, right? Like, sure. you know, I, I don't know what the threshold is. Like, do we need another one more podcast? Do we need another minute or do we need another hundred? Who knows? Um, and then to the point where that gets to real time, where it's like, hey, I won't, I, I can't do it this weekend, but you know what, <laughs> just send the virtual me. Yeah, we couldn't do anything else together, but it would know enough about this to be able to do that, right? Our role will be just to put the links in. Just be like, talk about <laughs> Just go talk about this. I don't even, we don't even have time to talk about the links anymore. We get computers to talk about it for us. Let's get computers to talk about using computers for people. And then post the podcast uh, and all of the metadata that goes along with it for us and then promote the podcast for us. And then it's like, geez, why is it even, why are we even here, man? Um, is it just to see ideas come to life? I don't know. You can spend more time making um, funny balloon sounds. It's really what we do. We're going to have a lot of time for that, apparently, in the near future. All right. Well, this week, uh, this has been great. Uh, thank you for joining us and uh, check the links in the discord and I'll try to put them in the show notes as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Until next time.